next speaker is um, uh, uh, Alfred Vick, who is assistant professor at the School of Environmental Design at the University of Georgia. And his talk is going to be about reimagining the Chattahoochee River with geodesign. And I need to find it here. Uh, not there. There it is. Good. Great. <coughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, this has been great. I'm really excited to be here. This is my first geodesign conference, and it, it really has been inspirational to me to see how these tools are being made more accessible. And that's relevant to my talk because I'm going to be sharing our experience integrating geodesign processes into a graduate landscape architecture course at um, studio course at the University of Georgia College of Environment and Design. I co-teach this class with Allison Bramlett, who is my co-author on this presentation, and you heard from her, her yesterday. Um, the description of this, the, the published course description for this class, uh, which I want to read a part of it, is this course presents concepts of sustainable site design and their implications for landscape architecture with particular emphasis on the issues of environmental suitability, provision of ecosystem services, and geodesign. So this is built into this class. Um, each year we select projects for the studio that allow the students to investigate alternative design scenarios uh, in a variety of different environmental contexts and geographic scales. Last fall, in uh, fall of 2013, one of our projects focused on a 53-mile segment or stretch of the Chattahoochee River. Um, the Chattahoochee, as some of you might know, begins in North Georgia, um, flows just north around the edge of the uh, Atlanta metro area, and then if you're looking at the big map here, um, flows down along the Georgia-Alabama border, through the panhandle of Florida, and down into the, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, now, uh, the Chattahoochee has been the subject of intense uh, political and environmental scrutiny um, over the past several decades. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the tri-state water wars and other political disputes that go on about the Chattahoochee. However, it remains largely unseen and inaccessible to the residents of the Atlanta metro area, the Atlanta region. Um, so, recently, an organization, Chattahoochee Now, has formed as a non, um, an NGO, and they've been established to help coordinate uh, efforts to realize the ecological, social, and economic potential of the river to generate quality of life and economic benefits for the Atlanta area. So our studio came on board um, to be, become, be engaged with this group and bring the geodesign process to the planning that's going on now. Um, our group um, included 36 uh, Masters of Landscape Architecture graduate students uh, in this studio. They came with a range of different backgrounds. Um, some had undergrad degrees in architecture, landscape architecture, other design programs. We had engineering backgrounds, um, several different ologies, um, and a few that had GIS backgrounds. And I did want to uh, also mention that 50% of our students in this studio were international, primarily from China. Um, and the stakeholders involved in this project were dozens of different agencies, um, jurisdictions, and organizations that represented a broad cross-section of stakeholders with interests in the future of the Chattahoochee River. Um, those included EPA, National Park Service, Corps of Engineers, TPL, uh, river keepers, five different counties, four different city governments, and many, many more. Um, and so the purpose of our project, as we describe it to the students, was to generate a land use plan for this Chattahoochee River corridor. And that plan had to seek to create a balance, and this is coming directly from the mission of Chattahoochee Now, that balances conservation, recreation, and development. Um, so they had to meet that vision. Uh, they also had to research and understand all the context, all the work that had been done related to this corridor. Um, had to engage stakeholders and meet the learning objective of our course, which includes um, doing this within the framework of a geodesign process. So here's our process. Um, here's it diagrammed by me on our studio whiteboard and then more artistically rendered by one of the students at the end of the, the project. Um, but what you can see here is this, hopefully, the geodesign framework, integrating and iterating um, throughout this process. And we did break it down into three kind of broad categories of inventory, analysis, and design. And I'll go into a little bit of detail about each of these. You can see the structure included teamwork and individual work. And there's a, throughout this process, we were emph emphasizing the collaboration, 
but we also had to keep in mind our instructional goals of wanting each student to be able to experience every aspect of this, and so we were trying to balance the, the individual work with the teamwork um, throughout this process. So first, inventory. Um, this phase we, was describing the project. Uh, we had the students, and they were seeking to assimilate existing data, um, generate research um, about the site, and establish the ecological, um, cultural, and eco economic context of the study area, and culminating in a definition of that project area. Um, second, in the analysis phase, um, in this phase, we identified, um, had the students identify proposed program elements and suitable locations for those to occur. I'll go into more detail on that. And then the third phase was the design phase, at which point um, we had the students generate alternative scenarios for this. Um, and, and feedback was incorporated throughout this process. So first, the research phase, this inventory phase. Uh, so we had the students start out by researching metropolitan river case studies around the world. Each student took on one particular project, which they identified themselves, and we modeled these after the Landscape Architecture Foundation case studies. So we asked the students to, to research these projects and, and to the extent that they could, document performance metrics for these projects, you know, published by other people, um, and present this to the class. The whole purpose of this was to establish just the ideas, establish some possible scope, some range of possibilities that they could consider in thinking about their own designs. Um, and then we went into truly the data collection about the site. So we broke into inventory groups. We had six different groups, hydrology, physiography, vegetation and biology, um, green space and, and um, park space, um, historic and cultural resources, infrastructure and transportation, and demographics. And in the studio, we brainstormed under each of these categories. What's, what are the bits of data? What are the, the layers or the themes that have to be acquired to fill out and round out our understanding of these different things? And so here's the list that we generated here. And of course, you can start to imagine that each of these is associated with a different uh, GIS layer. Um, so we determined all these research and data needs, and then each, each group was tasked with going out, uh, identifying and pulling together and presenting this data to the class. So here we're broken into six groups of six students each. Um, I do want to point out that a lot of these students were coming in with absolutely no GIS background. They were using this for the first time. So much of the data did have to be prepared for the students, and I want to thank Jacobs Engineering for, for providing a lot of that, that data for us for use in the class. Um, and so at the end of this inventory process, each of the groups generated a particular inventory map associated with their information and they presented this to the rest of the studio um, for everyone's use. So we're kind of working um, in these six groups, working towards this inventory goal. Each student did have to then take all of this data and produce their own individual composite inventory um, as a way of you know, rounding out their understanding of the entire site. Now you'll notice um, at this stage, here's our 53 miles running through or north of uh, the Atlanta area, at this stage, our boundary is five counties, five county area. And we did that intentionally because we didn't know what we wanted our boundary to be. And so we began at this point, now that we knew the data and had the data, what should we, what should we set as the limits of our corridor? And we considered a number of different options. Should it be the five county boundaries? Should it be, um, should it be the Huck 12 you know, watersheds that are adjacent to, the, you know, that touch the river? Should it be the... Um, uh, kind of arbitrary jurisdictional boundary, which is a 1,000-foot um, Metropolitan River Protection Act boundary. And all these things didn't seem to be adequate. They didn't quite work. So through some um, exploration and discussion, we ended up on a three-mile buffer on either side of the river along these 53 miles with a few little modifications to include some important resources. And this ended up being kind of the sweet spot of including most of the resources we were interested in, uh, but not overreaching and going, um, you know, too far beyond. So it ended up being a 318 square mile area that we were looking at. We moved into analysis and worked with our stakeholders at this point to identify what are some of the program elements that might be included. Um, and, and you can see the 12 that we listed here, active rec, agriculture, commercial development, conservation, um, cultural resource interpretation or education, 
ecological restoration, industrial development, multi-use trails, passive rec, residential development, riverfront development, and transportation enhancements. So these are our, 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 our program elements. We broke into 12 groups, three people each, and each of these groups had to then identify what are the suitability criteria that will affect the selection of locations to, to, to think about locating these things. So each group did a bunch of research and brainstorming about what those su suitability criteria would be. And again, this was a very collaborative process. Um, we had all of this information and all the suitability criteria um, compiled on a big Google Doc spreadsheet that everyone in the class had access to. And of course, we as faculty were monitoring and adding our own comments into it as they were working through this process. At the end of this stage, we had 12 different suitability maps, each identifying the areas that are highly or moderately or less suitable for particular, um, particular land use or program element. Um, and from there, presented this at this stage to the stakeholders and got feedback on a variety of things. Uh, recognizing this is an iterative process, we asked questions like, what did we miss? Was our suitability criteria you know, on target or or not, how can we revise this? How can we make it more, um, you know, more effective? And so the groups took that feedback and revised their suitabilities. Um, now, moving into the design phase, this, you know, we kind of shifted everyone into individual work at this point. And one of the first things we did before letting them start design is take, have them take a step back, think about the inventory, the case studies, our client, the stakeholders, and establish a set of guiding principles that's gonna guide them through this design process. Um, they had to incorporate the mission of the Chattahoochee Now and stakeholder input, but each student had a slightly different priority for their, their guiding principles. Um, from there, oops, had them generate their own individual composite suitability analysis. Um, there was, we let them, we gave them the freedom to take different approaches to generating the composite suitability. A lot of them ended up compiling the program elements into different um, kind of broader themes. You can see this student thought about preservation, development and recreation um, is kind of a, a mashup of, of um, some of those elements and then brought those together by selecting out the most suitable areas for each of those three things. Other students um, use different methods. This is one student, just the southern portion of, of the corridor. And um, you can see the, um, the suitability analysis and then moving into um, the, the land use plan here. And so this was, you know, he took kind of a constraining method where he identified, you know, the most suitable areas, prioritized those, and then started kind of looking at secondary um, priorities after that. And a number of different strategies. I did want to point out that we had a few students that were, um, you know, well-versed in GIS, and so one student used the Lucis model and actually went through a, a very comprehensive analysis of the land use conflicts and, and, and generating... Um, a great uh, composite map there, and that influenced her master plan, or land use plan. Um, and so, again, a number of different things. At the end, we ended up with 36 different land use plans uh, that we pinned up along the wall here, took up the entire studio, and again, at that point, had stakeholder feedback. We presented this to stakeholders and got their feedback. Um, some of the students had a more conservation-oriented approach, some a more development-oriented approach, some emphasized recreation. Most students had a pretty balanced approach to this in terms of their, their, their guiding principles. Um, the other thing that we had them do, every student had to document their process, the, the process that we used. And this was probably I, perhaps the most valuable part of this because it really is all about the process, and this is something that we emphasized throughout the, uh, throughout the project. Um, this was our highest priority learning objective, is that they embraced, understood the value of this process um, altogether. And so everyone did this, a, a diagram here. So discussion, lessons learned. First, I want to say um, the cyclical nature of geodesign certainly builds confidence in the students and, um, and help them refine these different scenarios. Uh, Providing that timely feedback by faculty and the stakeholders is critical. It was sometimes difficult with a group of 36 students. Um, and so that's, you know, we recognize that. Um, the engaged stakeholders are priceless. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the value of this geodesign process, I think, for many of the students, this was too big of an area for us to go and conduct an on-site investigation. So we, we got some very reliable, I think, work done without, you know, without the ability to visit the site. Um, 
there were some you know, new things revealed, I think, that were, that were um, valuable. This, the balance of individual and group work um, was good. It helped us avoid some of the unnecessary duplication of effort, but still allowed every student to have the, the complete experience. Um, one of the things we uh, reiterated over and over again is that this whole process is giving them the credibility and defensibility of their design uh, when, when talking to their, their clients or our stakeholders. Um, we had a huge range of experience with GIS. We had two graduate students, graduate assistants to help us, and that was helpful. Um, but it was difficult to manage uh, the, the technical support needed to run a studio like this with this range of different experiences. And some students, when I say here, some had difficulty with the geo and geo design, and some had difficulty with the design and geo design. And what I mean by that is some had difficulty with the software, with, you know, with the technical aspects, and had trouble overcoming that. Some had difficulty transitioning into the more creative design part because they, they'd been you know, using the GIS and they wanted GIS to generate the, the master plan for them. And so there, you know, that's something we as faculty really have to continue to uh, encourage and, and, uh, and manage that, that, that back and forth. So process is key. Um, I think it was, it was a very successful project and we can expect, fully expect to continue uh, uh, refining this. Uh, thank you.